All right. So I think we've all been there, right? Mm -hmm. You know that feeling where it's like, hey, I'm learning new stuff. I'm getting better at my job. Yeah. Shouldn't my pay reflect that? Yeah. And that's the whole idea behind skill-based pay, right? Mm -hmm. Get rewarded for what you gain OW, Mm -hmm. not just for how long you've managed to not get fired, basically. Exactly, exactly. So today we're taking a deep dive into this whole concept of skill-based pay. And we're lucky enough to have like decades of experience to draw on. Mm. We're digging into these management update newsletters from Svensson and Wallace or SWI. Great firm. Performance technology consulting, all that good stuff. These newsletters go from like the late 80s to the mid 2000s. Yeah, it's a gold mine, really. I mean, you see how this idea of skill based pay evolved over a really critical time in the business world. And SWI was right there in the thick of it, figuring out like, how do you actually measure skills? How do you make sure it's fair? Right. Because on the surface, it seems so simple, right? You learn a new skill, you get a raise, but it gets complicated really fast. I got it. One of the biggest uh, challenges that jumped out at me from these newsletters was actually a project that SWI did designing a skill-based pay system for Alaskan oil fields. Oh, okay. And you start to think about the range of jobs there, right? You've got your geologists, you've got your engineers, you've got people actually running the rigs. Well, how do you even begin to compare those, right? Like, yeah. what's a good geologist skill versus a good engineer skill? Exactly. And how do you measure that in a way that's fair and makes sense? It's not as simple as just saying, okay, well, you've been an engineer for five years, so you're automatically more skilled than someone with three years of experience. Because experience isn't everything. Exactly. You could have someone with two years of experience who's just killing it, who's mastered certain things way faster. And that gets at something that really struck me from the newsletters, this whole idea of not just having skills, but being able to prove that you have them. Absolutely. And that can get, well, a little uncomfortable, especially when you bring in examples like that Bank of America case that SWI talks about. They were like ranking all their employees and actually firing the bottom tier, which yikes. Yeah. And that's a perfect example of what SWI called a norm referenced approach. Yeah. And it highlights how skill based pay can go wrong, really wrong. Norm referenced. So you're saying even if Theoretically, everyone's doing a fantastic job. Someone still has to get the axe because they're at the bottom of the curve. Exactly. It's this constant pressure cooker. You're always being compared to everyone else. And no matter how well you're doing, there's this fear that it's not enough. So it's like this messed up game where the rules are always changing and there's always going to be a loser. Right. And how motivating is that, really? I mean, SWI argued that... A true skill-based pay system should be about encouraging growth and development, not about pitting employees against each other. So before the break, we were getting into this idea of the bigger picture. Yeah. Which I like because it feels like there's got to be more to it than just, hey, you learned how to use a new spreadsheet function. Here's a nickel. Right. It's not about these little incremental things. SWI really took a more holistic view looking at the entire organization and its goals. Okay, so how'd they do that? Give me an example. Well, one of the key things they focused on was something called workload analysis. Workload analysis. Sounds intense. A little bit, but it makes sense when you think about it. Basically, it's about figuring out how much work actually needs to be done and then figuring out the most efficient way to get it done, given the resources available. Okay, so like not just assuming we need to hire more people, but actually figuring out where those people are needed most. Exactly. And SWI actually developed a whole method for this. They would start by forecasting the number of labor hours needed for different staff categories, right? Like how many hours of engineering time? do we need? How many hours of marketing time? Makes sense. And then they'd compare that to the existing workforce to see if there were any gaps or overlaps. So it's like, okay, we're projecting we need this much engineering work, but we only have this many engineers. We need to hire more engineers oh. or maybe not. Right. Because you were saying they also looked at outsourcing. Exactly. Could some of those tasks be done more efficiently or cost effectively by a third party? That was always a question they considered. Okay. So it's about strategically aligning the resources with the actual work that needs to be done. And I'm guessing this approach probably helped companies avoid those situations where they go on a hiring spree and then a couple of months later. Layoffs. Exactly. Happens all the time. And SWI saw this firsthand. Companies would get so fixated on headcount, treating it like it was just a number on a spreadsheet, not fully grasping the long-term costs associated with each new hire. So it's not just a salary. It's benefits. It's training. It's office space. All of that. And the impact on company culture, which can be huge, 
Speaking of impact, it sounds like SWI was really ahead of the curve with this whole data-driven approach to workforce planning. Oh, absolutely. But it wasn't just about crunching numbers, yeah. right? They also talked a lot about the importance of measuring what matters. Right. Data is only useful if it's actually telling you something meaningful. You can have mountains of data, but if you're not measuring the right things, it's useless. So how do you know what to measure? That's where SWI's expertise really came in. They would work with companies to define their goals and then figure out the key performance indicators, KPIs, that would actually track progress towards those goals. It's like that old saying, you get what you measure, but it sounds like SWI was saying, make sure you're measuring the right stuff. Exactly. So like, don't get so caught up in tracking every little thing that you lose sight of the bigger picture. Right. Okay, so we're back. And I've got to say, this whole conversation about skill-based pay it really gets you thinking about the human side of things. Oh, for sure. Because it's easy to get caught up in the numbers, right? The yeah. skills, the measurements, the paychecks. Right. But at the end of the day, it's people we're talking about. Absolutely. And SWI was really ahead of their time in recognizing that. I mean, they understood that any successful performance management system had to take those human factors into account. You know, the motivations, the aspirations. The fears. Exactly. I mean, they're human beings, well, right? Yeah. Not just cogs in a machine. So how do you actually build a system that supports people instead of like turning them into robots? Well, one of the things SWI stressed was the importance of aligning systems with not just organizational goals, but individual and team skills and knowledge as well. Okay, so you got to know what you're aiming for as a company, but you also got to know what makes each person tick. Right. And what each team is good at. Foster a culture where people can actually grow and develop their skills, right? It's funny, I was looking at some of SWI's materials earlier, and they actually had this really interesting example of this. Oh, yeah. What's that? It was about their own internal qualification system. Right. They designed it themselves. Yeah. And get this, everyone at SWI, from like the top partners to the administrative staff, they all had to go through this qualification process. They weren't just talking the talk, they were walking the walk. Exactly. So they knew firsthand how it felt to be on the receiving end of that system. And I think that gave them a really valuable perspective when they were working with other companies. They okay. could relate to the anxieties, the challenges, the potential pitfalls. Which leads me to something else that really stood out from the newsletters, this idea of sabotage. Uh, yes. But not sabotage in like the traditional sense. Not like, you know, someone sneaking in and cutting the wires on the copy machine. Exactly. They were using it more broadly. Right. More like any behavior that was holding people back or creating obstacles. And oftentimes, the sabotage was unconscious. People weren't even aware they were doing it. So what was causing it? Fear, basically. Fear of the unknown. Fear of failure. Fear of change. It's so interesting, right? Because we often think of sabotage as this deliberate act, but sometimes it's just people being afraid. Exactly. Like, if people don't understand why a new system is being implemented or they're not sure how it's going to affect them, they're more likely to resist it, even if it's actually in their best interest. So how do you overcome that fear? Well, SWI believed that transparency was key. Communicate clearly and openly about the reasons behind the changes. Be upfront about the potential challenges and how you're going to address them. It's about bringing people along for the ride instead of just springing it on them. Exactly. This has been such an insightful conversation. It really drives home the point that effective performance management is about so much more than just, you know, setting targets and measuring outcomes. It's about people. It's about fostering a culture of growth, transparency, and collaboration. Creating an environment where everyone feels valued and empowered to do their best work. Well said. And on that note, we're going to wrap up this deep dive into the world of skill-based pay and performance management. We hope you found this exploration of SWI's insights as thought-provoking as we did. Until next time, keep those brains buzzing and those questions coming.